Welcome to the Source of Commercial Real Estate, where we discuss all things non-residential commercial real estate, including finding and funding deals, market intel, finding a competitive advantage, and using real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host, Jonathan Hayek, and today I am talking with Coleman Weatherholtz. Coleman believes vibrant buildings make for vibrant cities. Since 2005, she's helped shape Atlanta, bringing buildings to life by connecting their owners with leading retail and hospita hospitality brands and facilitating over $100 million of leases. Coleman has been the tip of the spear, leading the retail leasing efforts for some of Atlanta's most iconic properties, including Buckhead Village, CNN Center, The Battery Atlanta, Summerhill, Collier Village, and Ashford Lane. A dot connector and a student of consumer trends, design, and markets, Coleman provides property owners with the tools to create wonderful places. Using her relationship with researchers, consultants, contractors, she helps property owners vet their plans. Her experienced eye brings context, helping owners refine their ideas. Her retailer relationships then bring those ideas to life. Coleman is the founder of Automatic, a collaboration platform for independent retail and hospitality brands, capital providers, and building owners. Coleman, I am really looking forward to having this conversation. Leasing brokers are an integral piece in the commercial real estate puzzle. Um, Coleman, how are you doing today? I am great. Thank you. Excited to be here and to be chatting with you. And I love to hear of people that understand the importance of a real estate broker. Absolutely. <laughs> it is a, a key component. Great. Well, hopefully we'll hear a lot more about it today. Coleman, why don't we start out by you telling us about your background, how you got started in real estate and what your work looks like today? Yeah, sure. So I actually, my first job out of college, um, which I think became a good foundation for what I do now with my marketing techniques and how I approach leasing, was actually with um, Ogilvy and marketing and PR. So um, while it was in the tech sector and not in real estate, at a very young age, at the age of 23, I was picking up the phone and cold calling editors at Wall Street Journal um, and major publications around the country and pitching my tech clients um, and telling these editors why they needed to write about my clients. And then I saw the impact um, that it had when these stories, publications did cover my clients. Um, it was a tremendous, it had a tremendous impact on their business. So um, I, I love that business, but I wanted to get into real estate because I really wanted to be, there were, there were levels in marketing that you, you had to stay within. Um, and really you weren't able to determine um, how hard you worked didn't necessarily mean that you would go up to the next level. So I wanted to be in something where it's more entrepreneurial, where I really had the ability to, you know, determine my destiny by how hard I worked and, and, and what I put into my business and, and real estate obviously offered that. Um, but I was able to take some of those, you know, those marketing and PR fundamentals that I, um, learned at Ogilvy and bring them over really successfully to the leasing world because you can have the greatest project in the world, but if no one knows about it, <laughs> um, it's not going to be successful. So, you know, I learned the power of relationships. I had to build the relationships with these editors and, um, to get them to trust me. And similarly, you have to do that in the real estate world. I've built, I've built great relationships with retailers and restaurateurs, and they answer my call and they call me back because um, they have my trust. Um, and then, you know, I, I just learned the, um, again, just the, the really the power of, um, of, of making those connections and then positioning um, projects in the correct way so that it appeals to these retailers and restaurateurs that, that you are pursuing for a project. Yeah, when I, I'm now approaching 40, and when I look back in my early 20s, um, I hear other people talk about this idea of the importance of those first few jobs um, and those first few experiences out of college in your 20s. And 
people in your 20s, people in your 20s, if you're listening, I know there's this tendency and this desire to want to have everything figured out and you want to have your whole life plan figured out and um, and you're working towards, you know, that final goal. But Coleman, I think that was such a great example that you started in marketing and PR, but um, in for a non real estate related company, but yeah. you learned these crucial skills um, that are serving you now. And I think about when you mentioned cold calling, um, cold calling is something that um, I know would serve my business well, but I'm so resistant to doing. Can you talk about? Um, I'm sure you, you still have to cold call today, or yeah, at least cold yeah. calling has gotten you uh, to, you know, has made an impact in where you are today. You've got to get comfortable hearing no. You've got to get comfortable being hung up on, um, you know, following up, all kinds of things. Can you talk about um, just that one skill, cold calling, and learning that early on and how that has served you today? Sure. I think, you know, it, it is about getting comfortable with with reaching out to someone you don't know and potentially being hung up on or um, yelled at for calling them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really about getting that confidence with yourself and more importantly, the confidence um, of believing in what you're calling them about. So, you know, once I, whether it was in the PR world or, um, you know, in real estate, if I really believe in a project, um, it is easy for me to pick up the phone and call these retailers and restaurateurs and tell them why they need to be at this project because I truly believe they need to be there. You know, I am I am the ultimate consumer. And, and I like to, in addition to getting into commercial real estate because of the kind of unlimited revenue potential, it is also because I'm the ultimate consumer. So um, I, uh, you know, if if I'm calling up a retailer or a restaurateur and saying they need to be in a project, then I really believe they need to be there and that they'll do well. So I think I think that's the key. You've got to believe, you've got to believe what you're selling. So um, and that that's that's helped me tremendously. Sure, there's a difference between selling something you believe in and. Um you know, selling vacuum cleaners. Well, um, and so, totally. I th yeah. And so I think that makes a huge difference um, yeah. if you believe in it and you believe that this opportunity will be right for whoever it is you're 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 trying to pitch. Coleman, let's get into um, one of the projects that you've worked on recently. You have yeah. been um, instrumental in shaping some of Atlanta's, uh, you know, biggest centers and, um, and, uh, and really redeveloping and, and and shaping what they are today. So let's start with the Summerhill project. I feel like if we go into some of these projects, we can really see um, and get a good idea of your expertise and how you execute your vision. So um, Atlanta is a uh, a booming market. So let's talk about Summerhill. Tell me, for those of us not in Atlanta, like myself, um, tell me what Summerhill is, what it was, and kind of what the vision is, what the vision was, and, and what it is today. Sure. So Summerhill originally, um, Summerhill is the name of the original neighborhood um, that is one of the oldest um, African-American and Jewish communities, neighborhoods within Atlanta. Um, it sits just south of downtown. It was for years a thriving community, um, a big sense of pride in it. And then um, just with kind of the flight to the suburbs um, in the 70s and, um, you know, that that started to change with the interstate coming through. Um, and then you had um, the Braves built Turner Field. They had their stadium there for years, um, which was a great thing to have the Braves in the city of Atlanta. But for the community um, around the stadium, there was a sea of, of parking fields um, and they were able to make money off of that parking. So there was really no incentive to develop that area. So because of that, the Summerhill community itself really suffered. Um, there, there, you know, it wasn't vibrant. There wasn't retail, there weren't restaurants, um, there wasn't really a sense of community. So um, probably it's been about six or seven years ago, the Braves decided that they were going to 
um, build a new stadium in Cobb County. And that kind of left this big, you know, hole south of downtown with this empty stadium of what are we going to do um, with this area? What can it be? So my client came in, it was a total of 80 acres. Um, they had formed a public private uh, venture with Georgia State University, which is um, the largest university within our um, university system here in Georgia. And um, they made a plan to take all of the Georgia State's athletic department and move it into um, a portion of Summerhill. So they moved, the first thing that they did was Georgia State moved their football um, stadium into the old Turner Field, which also had been the old Olympic Stadium when the Olympics were here in Atlanta. Um, so, which was great because, you know, you didn't want that torn down. It was reusable. It's the perfect use for this great school that sits in, this great university that sits in downtown Atlanta to be able to reuse the stadium. Um, but then on the, on the private side, my developer, my client came in and we thought, what do we do here? Because this area has been overlooked for so long. What is the plan? How do we make it vibrant again? What is the first step? And there was this little street called Georgia Avenue. It had about 40,000 square feet of old historic um, buildings that at one point were the old grocer, the old butcher for what was this thriving Summerhill community. Um, and we said, let's start there. Like it wasn't a, a lot of square footage, but these beautiful old buildings, we just knew they had such great bones and character and they, you know, had survived through all of these different stages um, of what had happened to this area. And so it's funny, the first time I went down there, they my, my client called me and said, okay, come tour and let's get your thoughts on, on what we can do. So I go down there. There is literally a mattress, an old dirty mattress laying in front of this old historic building. The windows are blown out and I step inside and there's a tree growing through the middle of it. Um, but I could see how beautiful it was. So I was like, let's start here. Let's start on with these old historic buildings. Um, and so we did. And so, you know, kind of the, the thought process was let's start here. Let's uh, it, in my thinking of who we wanted to target for those buildings, let's target retailers and restaurateurs that we know have a connection to this community. So our first tenant that we that we went after um, were these great restaurateurs who their grandfather had been, they were Jewish. There was a, a hospital there within the Summerhill community. Their grandfather had been born at this hospital. Um, he had always talked to them about what a great Jewish community Summerhill had once been. Um, so we went to them. We also knew they were pioneering. We also knew that they had gone into other areas of Atlanta that had not yet experienced change, but we knew it was coming and that they had been able to go in and be one of the first people in and had been able to be successful. So we went to them, we told them that we wanted to, you know, we were going to revitalize, we were making a commitment to revitalize the Summerhill community, and they were 100% on board, you know, let's, and, and they actually came in and they ended up doing a new concept for us. And they did a, um, a barbecue restaurant in this old brick building that had once been a restaurant, you know, back in the 30s in Summerhill. Um, they put in a smokehouse, they put in these great outdoor patio areas, and now it's super vibrant um, and, you know, one of the best barbecue restaurants in Atlanta. Um, but, you know, just just great to see that transformation happen. So we did that along Georgia Avenue and we were able to go out and get these great restaurant tours um, within the Atlanta community to open very unique concepts. We have these great outdoor patios so that you could bring the community in. They could linger, they could drink, they could have conversations, enjoy great food. Um, we filled it in with uh, some local, um, you know, retailers that were really involved with the community. And then from there, and those deals, by the way, were not the greatest 
deals um, when you look at the rents um, on those deals. And some of these tenants didn't have the best credit, um, but we believed in their concept. We knew they had roots in the community. So we um, filled up this 40,000 square feet. It came together so nicely. It was just amazing how quickly um, you started to see a community again. We opened the barbecue restaurant. We opened a um, coffee shop that became like the hub of the community again. We opened an ice cream store. We opened a pizza shop, a hamburger shop, a donut shop. So all the things that, you know, people of all ages and backgrounds enjoy. Um, and then from there, we had this great halo effect that took place. So that happened. People started coming down. Um, you had, we had a townhome developer that came in that was interested and they built a hundred townhomes. We built student housing, 700 beds that leased immediately. We built multifamily that was incredibly successful. Um, and then we were, I, I reached out to Publix knowing that this community had not had a grocer in over 60 years. And it was something that we repeatedly heard from the community that they wanted. They said, it's a food desert. We need a grocer. Um, so I reached out. We worked on that deal for probably four years and we were able to get Publix down and they just recently opened. The mayor was there. People that have lived in the Summerhill community for generations were there talking about what an incredible thing. They never thought they would have this great, beautiful grocery store in their community. Um, so it was, it, it's incredibly successful and, and really speaks to the power of you can do something small with the right um, retailers and restaurateurs that really starts to build that community and then have a great halo effect with everything else that you do. So had we not started with that first little Georgia Avenue section, we wouldn't have been able to do the townhomes. We wouldn't have been able to do the multifamily. We wouldn't have been able to bring Publix in. It wouldn't have been as big of a success. Um, so I always look at projects from like, let's, you know, maybe this, a few of these deals we have to do on the front end are not the best deals. Um, economically, but make sure that you get the right people in and create the right vibe and you will have a halo effect on everything else that you do. Gosh, I, I wrote down a ton of questions. That sounds like a really <laughs> I did cool a lot project. Of no, that, I get very passionate about this and that was uh, perfect. So that project. I love that. So um, first I want to ask, um, so you talked about the client initially. So who was the client? You don't have to tell me the name, but was this the owner of the old Turner Field? Was this an owner of, um, you talked about the initial, what, 40 acres um, sure. or 80, 80 acres initially. Who, who was the client that you were working for initially? So this was, the client was Carter. It was a partnership on the private side. Carter, which is um, a developer here in Atlanta, they do you know all all um, asset classes, but primarily uh, focused on office originally, um, and then more recently some multifamily development. Um, but didn't really um, had not done a ton of retail, and so they had a partner, um, Healy Weatherholtz, who also came in, who were very much a um, focused on retail community building. And so they were the private side um, when I talk about the client. And I'm assuming that this is someone who bought the parcel after they knew the Braves were leaving. This was not a longtime owner of the land who was no. like, shoot, I had, you know, I had all this, all this revenue coming in from parking lots and stuff. And now I've got nothing. This was someone who came in after the fact and was like, hey, we can redevelop this. Yes, yes. This was a, um, this was, you know, like I said, there was a lot of controversy when the Braves left the city of Atlanta. Um, and they went to Cobb County. And subsequently, I actually worked on the new Braves Stadium, which has been highly successful, the Battery Atlanta. They've done a great job of creating this 365 day a year entertainment district in Cobb County. It's been a big win um, for the people of Cobb County because of the revenue generated from the taxes off of that project. 
And then ultimately a big win for Atlanta because Summerhill was able to be revitalized um, and it's, it's thriving. And um, so, so no, though, when this first happened and the Braves announced that they were leaving, you know, the city was like, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with this vacant stadium? Um, who is, and, and, and to that point, this area of Atlanta had really been overlooked. So a lot of people um, did not want to touch it. They didn't believe that it could be successful. They did not believe that you could have thriving retail and restaurants, that you could have development take place and that people would come. Um, so this was really a vision of my client saying, we believe in it. We see what's happening in the city. We see that this is a great area of the city. Um, and they, you know, and then they were able to do this partnership with Georgia State. And it was just such a win-win a, a um, for the city of Atlanta, for Georgia State. Um, and then also, ultimately, you know, the, the Braves have built a, a great new development in Cobb County. So win-win for everyone. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, it's, uh, I think on the one hand, it's a, hopefully a lesson that the Braves learned from what happened in Turner Field. And it was really a sign of the times of in the 90s when I'm, I'm an avid baseball fan. And so, oh, um, you know, when baseball stadiums were built in the 70s, 80s and 90s, the model was build a stadium with a sea of parking lots. But then, mm -hmm. um, you know, later on in the late 90s and into the 2000s, they thought, well, it's really wasted space when, you know, you're only playing baseball six months a year. What about the other six months? Let's make this a really thriving and vibrant area with retail and restaurants and public transportation. Um, so yes, we need parking lots and parking garages, Gosh. but we also want people to stay, come before the game and stay after the game and come in in December when there's no baseball. Um, and so, um, yeah, so hopefully that was a lesson learned and, um, and good things can come out of it. Tell me about um, the, I want to, I want to focus on the vision and getting that first tenant. Um, it sounds like you were very selective in choosing that first tenant. Um, and you weren't just going to, you know, there could be a tendency of, oh, we're doing a redevelopment. Let's get a bunch of national tenants in there. Let's talk to Cold Stone and let's talk to, right. you know, the Gap and, you know, whoever. Um, right. You know, you had a distinct vision for it. And I love that it was um, a lot of bringing back to life what was there in the past. Um, so, Tell me about that first tenant, those conversations with that first tenant of, you know, hey, there's nothing here now, and I know it looks a little rough, but here's our vision. Um, sure. Can you tell me about your relationship with that tenant beforehand and how you went about convincing that tenant to, to take up some space there and really be the first through the door? Sure. So I would say, you know, when... I do think it's so important with all of these projects because there are so many projects taking place across the country. The first thing that I tell my clients when we're looking at a large scale project like this is what's going to set you apart? What's the, what's, what makes you different? Um, and so many retailers, restaurants these days, they want to be in a unique project because that really, that, that sets them apart. And it's really about their brand alignment. Like what are they, you know, what is a, um, by way of example, what, what is a Lululemon wanting to project their images? You know, it's not uh, a shopping mall. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's, so, so many of these, you, you have to be conscious of that. It's so important these days. Like, what is the image that your project is projecting? Um, because those retailers and restaurateurs are going to be looking at that and they want to make sure that the image that your project is projecting is aligned with their brand. Um, so I think when looking at these projects, you know, specifically Summerhill, and they're all done like obviously on a case by case basis, depending on what the community is um, and who your customer is. So with Summerhill, the whole story was there's this kind of forgotten community that was once like thriving and incredibly successful and all about community. And then it lost all of that community. So, um, and over the years, um, you know, different mayors would come in to the city of Atlanta and they would promise 
that they were going to, you know, fulfill their promise to Summerhill and make it great again. And it never happened. And so when we sat down and started looking at the vision for Summerhill, it was like, let's, let's really do this. Like people have said they were going to do this. Let's really do it. Let's make it a thriving. Let's, let's keep the historic nature of it. So it was really important to keep those old historic buildings. And then we did build some new buildings, but we wanted them along that Georgia Avenue, that first piece that we did, but we wanted them to be very much in keeping with, with what was already there. So, um, you know, our, our vision there was let's build back the community. And what we did, which was kind of, and, and you know, I also recommend this to clients, um, we did a really short video. It was maybe like 15 seconds um, that had some great images of the Summer Hill neighborhood, like people on skateboards, um, kids playing basketball on the basketball court down the street. Um, and it, there was a, we found a clip from our old mayor of the city of Atlanta who talked about the Summer Hill community and what a vibrant community it was and how Atlanta was making a promise to Summer Hill that they were going to bring it back. It was a community with soul. So we were like, let's use that and let's like really do it. And let's bring back the soul to this community. So we did that little clip. And again, it was just these little images and it was a snippet of the mayor talking. And then we showed great food, you know, kind of a here's here's what's to come. Um, and we sent that out. And that was the video that I sent to that um, those restaurateurs that I talked about that ultimately ended up opening the barbecue restaurant. I sent that to them and it was really like it set the tone for here's what you can expect from this project. If you like what you see in this, if you want to be aligned with kind of this, um, you know, with this identity, with this uh, purpose of bringing back the community, you should be here. And it was probably the fastest response I've ever gotten when I've reached out to someone via email. Um, to that point, though, when you start these projects, I think there's a tendency for a lot of developers to say, OK, we're doing this project. So let's just like get like you were saying, every national retailer out there, every restaurateur, and let's just blast them with e-blast. That's not effective. I mean, it, it may be, but it's not going to get you if you're looking to do something like Summerhill, it's not going to get you the results that you're looking for. You have to be very like very specific and very targeted. You know, there was a list of maybe five people that I knew that I wanted to reach out to, to be our lead restaurant at Summerhill. And it was very, um, you know, it was, it was based on like, they needed to be pioneering. They needed to have other successful concepts. I wanted them to have a tie-in with the community. Um, I also looked at their existing locations and said, who, who likes to be around them that we would want at Summer Hill as well? Because that's a big thing too. You want to make sure that first tenant that you're bringing in is going to attract the other tenants that you're looking for and that they like to be co-tenants. So, um, you know, my, what, what I always tell clients is that whole throw everything, just throw, you know, send it out there to the world and this mass marketing, like, that's not my approach. I don't think that's the best approach. You have to be very thoughtful about this. And, and when you are and, um, and you really know what's going on in the community and you really understand who these restaurateurs and retailers are and, and you know, where they want to be, it, it makes for these really great projects like Summerhill. So you touched on the idea of tenant mix, and I want to ask you more about this. So you get that first tenant in there, um, this great pioneering restaurant. And so how do you go about um, getting the next tenants? You did talk about getting um, coffee shop, ice cream mm -hmm. shop, pizza, donuts, and then you get housing in there. You get townhomes and student housing. And you talked about this halo effect that, you know, tenants attract other tenants. So talk to me about your strategy in filling up the rest of the space. You had this vision for what you wanted the space to look like. You get mm -hmm. this first tenant and you're like, okay, great. It's starting. So walk me through um, your, your vision for the next tenants and how you went about um, securing those next tenants? 
Sure. So, so very similar to that first one, you know, we again looked at who, um, who's pioneering, who's in the surrounding neighborhoods that's, that's really running a great business. Um, and so, you know, our, our coffee shop, they had an existing location in a, a close by neighborhood, um, Grant Park. And we knew that they were really kind of the hub of the community there. So we approached them and said, we have this great old building. We would love for you to come in and do a coffee shop with us. Um, like I said, they opened in tiny little coffee shop. I think they were like 1200 square feet and just became this like hub of activity. It was so great to see. Um, then we really wanted to, you know, kind of the thought process was what are those, um, what are those type of restaurants that are really approachable, um, appealing to, you know, people of all ages, all backgrounds. So, you know, everyone loves ice cream. <laughs> um, we, the coffee shop operator actually decided to open the ice cream shop. Um, there's lines out the door there now. It's great to drive by and see the people standing out there with their children and the strollers and waiting to get ice cream. But you'll see it's like, you know, it's a 70 year old standing next to a mom with her three children. And then, and then the, you know, the 20 something, like it's just this great um, mix of people to get to stand in line to get this incredible ice cream that she does. Um, you know, pizza, the, the donut shop I mentioned. So just really approachable foods. We had a brewery, a very small brewery, which again, I think those are so great. Um, I especially loved ours because it was small and um, it, it just drew people in all different backgrounds from all over the community. Um, it became a great gathering space. And then um, another great thing that I think that my client did and, um, you know, so much is um, of a project is also you can you've got to have a great design of the project. So their whole vision for this in order to create that community was to do patios next to all of these spaces. So all of these buildings, I think the smallest patio that we have there is a thousand square feet, which is a pretty large patio. And the whole um, Georgia Avenue connects by these outdoor patios. So, you know, looking at like, again, people who could really energize these patios, really bring that community, were involved in their community, um, but had a great product offering. And then, um, we do have just making sure, you know, different, we hit on different price points as well. So we have, you can go get a, a hot dog and a donut. Um, we have a little hot dog place that's great, um, you know, for relatively inexpensive um, dinner, or you can go to, there was this great chef um, who opened this restaurant that's become really nationally known and acclaimed. It's called Little Bear. Again, super small little restaurant. I think he's in 1500 square feet. He's very tied into the community. Young guy. This was his first restaurant. We believed in him. Um, but now he's just, you know, winning awards all over the country for this incredible, um, very uh, elevated like food experience um, that he's doing. So, yeah. Um, I've heard of this concept. It's kind of a micro restaurant concept. I've heard this being done in other places like Nashville. It helps, from what I understand, it helps to kind of reduce risk for both the um, both the the owner and the restaurateur. If you've got these small spaces, there's less of a build out to do. It keeps yeah. rent lower. And, you know, if one concept doesn't work out, it shouldn't be too difficult to get a different concept in there. And then likewise, it's um, the build out isn't as expensive because it's not this huge 10,000 square foot restaurant. Um, I yeah. want to ask you about, you alluded to it earlier that when you were signing these tenants, these were maybe not the best deals for you. You know, you are um, directly compensated based on the leases that you sign. And of course, any property owner is going to want the best lease possible. But at the same time, when you're redeveloping and taking on a project like this, you've got to have a long-term vision. And you've mm -hmm. got to know that year one, you might not be making any money in year one, but you're laying the foundation. So tell me about 
you know, just from a, from a business perspective, you know, when you're signing these tenants and there's, there's some risk there for, for those tenants in the early stages when, when they're pioneering, you know, it's a high risk, high reward kind of situation. So tell me about how you justified maybe getting less than ideal leases in order to kind of pioneer and start this redevelopment. Sure, sure. I think, you know, to your point, what helped us at Summerhill were these were smaller spaces. Um, so while we may have been taking a chance with a new young chef, um, like we did with Little Bear, um, we we believed in him. That's the most important thing. We knew that he could be successful. Um, it was a small space, so we weren't putting as much money in. So we kind of, you know, it's all about how you want to structure these deals. Um, we didn't put a ton of TI in, but we were able to give him concessions um, in those first two years to make sure that he had the foundation to get in there, get his sales to where they needed to be, work out any kinks in his operation. And then in the third year, you know, if that went well, the landlord would benefit from that. So there's certainly ways to structure that, you know, whether it's the first two years, it's a lower rent to help them get going. Um, percentage rent, we see a lot where we'll do a really low base rent. But um, if you really believe in the concept and know the, the numbers that they're going to be able to do, you can you know add that percentage rent component, um, free rent versus TI so that landlord isn't giving out as much capital up front. So there's not, you know, you don't feel like there's as much risk if they do fail because it's a smaller space. Um, those are all ways that we really get creative um, and, and afford you the ability to put some of these, um, you know, these these deals in place that, you know, um, and then shorter, shorter terms on the lease. So, you know, maybe instead of doing a 10 year deal, you're doing a five year deal. And in five years, they're established. They're able to pay market rent, market rent has increased at that point. Your whole project rent has gone up at that point because of what you've created um, on this, you know, with this great mix of local restaurants and retailers. Um, so, you know, you may not, like I said, it, it may have not been the best economic terms in the first one to two years but then you're able to make up for that later. And certainly when we talk about the halo effect, there's no doubt, and we see this in the office world, um, and we're seeing this more and more as you have occupancy levels drop in, in the office world. Um, we have office developers coming to us and saying, how can you help me? We understand how important it is to differentiate our office building by creating this great ground floor um, scene and amenity. And so, you know, we talk about with them, like to get that, that to create that, you need to be willing to um, do some deals that maybe you don't think are market deals, but those are ultimately going to drive your office rents, which is the halo effect and, and where it will make it worth it. So um, I'll give you one more example. I mean, we we and not even so much this was not a pioneering tenant i have a project that we recently completed an old power center um in a suburb just outside of buckhead atlanta um it's called the perimeter market and an old power center with a bunch of those you know national big the outback steaks house of the world the carabas um it it had a sea of parking um it was you know, just very nondescript, like think of your, you know, think of the worst power center that you've seen. And and that was it. Um, and I had a client that, um, you know, closed on it, brought it to us and said, you know, do, are you interested in leasing this? And we said, not if it looks like this, but we think it is just prime for repositioning and it has really good bones and it, um, and what it lacks is like I was saying with Summerhill, it lacks kind of that soul. So we were like, we would take a lot of this parking that's not needed and we would convert it to green space and let's make a lawn. So we made a 70,000 square foot lawn um, that has since become the like community space for this Dunwoody um, 
area. And um, we said, do that. And then, you know, let's just spruce up what is here. Let's um, really pay attention. My thing that I always say is the retail is in the details. So put out those great flower pots, do the mural on the side of the building, um, you know, hang some lanterns in between the buildings, um, things that just really beautify and spark people's creativity and interests. Like, let's do that. And then let's go after our dream restaurateur. So in this case, it was this guy, Ford Fry, who is by no means a pioneer, very well established. I would say one of the most sought after chefs in the Southeast right now. He's in Nashville and Texas and Atlanta and some of the greatest restaurants in Atlanta are his restaurants. Um, but we knew if we could go get him, like I explained to my client, if we go get him and we cut him a really nice deal, um, others will follow. And so we did. I convinced my client over a few margaritas that this was the correct um, the course to take. And we did. And it was everything fell into place from there. So so we were able to get Ford. Um, and then we said, you know, Ford, we want to get you here, but we want to be able to tell people that we have you here. We don't want to wait until you open. We want to be able to announce it. That's part of why we're giving this great deal. So, um, you know, he was on board with that. So then from there, we were able to go to these other tenants that we wanted and say, um, we've, we've got a Super Rica deal, which is a, a Tex-Mex restaurant that he has. It's, it's very popular here. Um, and from there, we kind of saw that, um, that domino effect of, of these other restaurants lining up to be there. So that's an example. It doesn't necessarily have to be a concept that's unproven or, a, you know, a new young chef that you're cutting these deals for. In many cases, it can be someone that's proven, that's a, just a really great operator that you know will kind of be the lead, you know, the, the, the lead anchor for you or the lead dog on this, um, on your project that then um, everyone will kind of line up behind. And, and in that case, we more than made up for we set the highest rent numbers in that market, which was already a really strong market. Um, this was an established market, high incomes, a very bustling, thriving retail market. We set the highest rents in that market um, because we kind of, you know, that that Super Rica deal was a little bit of a lost leader, but then we were able to more than make up for it with the rest rest of the development. Yeah. Great examples of the power of getting that acre tenant, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's the grocery store, whether it's the pioneering mm -hmm. restaurateur or just the well-known restaurateur. Um, when you, when you said you, you cut the restaurateur a great deal, um, you don't have to tell specifics, but um, are you talking about um, like concessions and free rent? Are you talking about bringing him in as part of the general partnership um, so that he sees upside in the center, you know, to attract a really well-known um, and really desirable tenant? What sort of concessions should someone expect to have to make? Sure. So in, in that specific case, the deal, when I say a good deal, we, he actually took over an old Outback Steakhouse. We gave him, it had bones in it, but it needed to be gutted. We gave it to him and said, you just take it. We gave him a nice TI package to do that. So we ended up not having to do any work, which was great from the landlord perspective. He was able to do his design the way that he wanted it, which was great from his perspective. So it was really a win-win. Um, so we gave him a very nice TI package to go in there and um, and do, you know, convert the space. And then we gave him a low percentage rent, I mean, a, a low base rent with a percentage rent. So which which worked out, it it has worked out very well. They are doing incredibly well um, at the center. So it's, again, been a win-win for everybody. And in um, those scenarios, you're writing into the lease that they have to report their financials either quarterly correct. or annually? Correct, correct. Okay. And so, you know, we're looking at, in that case, we looked at how were his other Super Rica locations performing in Atlanta kind of set that for the base of, you know, once you hit this threshold, you're going to start paying us X and percentage rent over this. So we were able to get, especially if you have a proven operator and you can look at their sales, 
we were able to get really comfortable with the fact that, look, none of his locations are making below X. We're at least going to hit that. Um, and then back into what we needed for percentage rent to really make it worth our while to cut that deal. You froze on me a Great. little bit, Jonathan. Sorry. Let's see. Are you still there? You went out for a second. Okay, yeah, there I'm we go. Here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Coleman, if perspective, if owners, landlords are hearing this and they're thinking, wow, what an incredible leasing broker. All my leasing broker does is take some pictures with their phone and put an ad up on LoopNet. I want someone who's well-connected and is really going to go to bat for me out in the community, um, knows these, uh, you know, knows people and is able to get great tenants. What suggestions or advice do you have for people for working with a great leasing broker? Yeah, I would say, you know, my biggest piece of advice is look at their projects, see what they've done. Um, that's the the greatest I think example to me and all you need to know about um, what they're, you know, what they're going to be able to do for you. So, you know, I really like to, when I take on a project, I really like to think through, um, will this project have an impact on my community? Will I be proud of it if I drive past it with someone? Will I be proud to say I did that project? And so I approach all projects that way. Um, and I look at them, my client relationships as long-term relationships. In some cases, I'm still working with clients that I worked with 20 years ago when I first got into the business. They're still clients. They've become friends. We've, we've repositioned projects and sold them and gone on to the next one. Um, so I would say, look at their work. Um, and I would say, um, you know, really approach it. It's, it's amazing to me, I think, how many interviews I've gone on for a project where maybe I got 30 minutes with the developer or potential client. And I'm like, don't you want to know more about me? Don't you, don't you, you know, because I approach projects as like, I am a part of your team. I am a long-term partner. Like we could be working together and if things go well, and my goal is that we work together, you know, for the next 20 years. So I would say, you know, don't just, don't just like approach hiring a broker. It's like, oh, we're just hiring a broker. They're all the same. Like really interview that broker, really get to know them. Um, and then look at the work that they've done. And then I would say also, you know, it's amazing to me also, like how many clients, potential clients have not asked me like, who are your favorite restaurants and why? What is your favorite retailers and why? You know, I mean, that's the, that's like the, the guts of what we do. So like, you want to know, like, who, who did your broker, where does she like to shop? Where does she like to dine? Is she out in the community? Is she, is she the ultimate consumer? You know, like I am, um, that's that's really important because if they're not there out there doing that, then they can't possibly know um, if that restaurant's going to be good for your project or if that retailer is going to succeed. I mean, you've you've really got to. I I kind of pride myself on the fact that, and you know, my my husband would laugh at this um, and maybe say it's not the greatest thing about me, but we go to a new we we go on vacation somewhere like the first thing I'm doing is I'm like Googling to find who are the best retailers and the best restaurants. And then I want to go there. Um, and then I want to, you know, then I want to actually shop there. <laughs> and um, So I think it's, you know, it's important that your brokers are also out there looking at other projects, not just in your community either, because so much inspiration. I mean, I was in Paris and um, Florence last year. So much inspiration comes from travel and, you know, look at, look at Europe, especially they have done it right. They've been doing it right for, you know, forever. So like take inspiration for that, like, you know, put the flower pots out on the street, let people have cafe tables and umbrellas, um, 
you know, it's uh, that you can you, you find a lot of inspiration from travel and looking at other projects. Um, and so I would say if you're hiring an agent, ask them what their favorite projects are around the world. Um, I think all of those things are important to really get a sense of of who you'd be working with. I love that advice. Um, Coleman, we're getting towards the end of our conversation here. I want to ask you about um, the the organization that you're starting, the meetup that you're starting, Automatic Meetup um, in Atlanta. You're doing it with your husband. So tell me, what is Automatic Meetup and um, what's your vision for it? Sure. So my husband is a retail developer. Um, we met through the business and he is very... Um, his developments are very community minded. And, um, you know, that obviously is, is my passion as well. So we, you know, we see all of these great retailers, restaurateurs um, with these great concepts similar to Summerhill. But in many cases, you know, they are they are great chefs. They're not great business operators. They don't know where to go to get the capital to open a restaurant. Um, and in many cases, they may just be relying on the money that the landlord's going to give them um, to open these businesses. And we've seen that in many cases, that's not enough. So, you know, I think such a great, there's such a great need of connecting all these great businesses that are out here in Atlanta with investors and, and, and getting them that capital source that they need to be able to open these um, businesses successfully. Um, and so that's something that we saw within our business that there was a need for in order to create these really cool places with these great creators that just, you know, they're, they're great at what they do. They just don't know where to go to find the um, capital sources. And then um, on the, you know, from this side of like looking at just developments, Atlanta, there's some there's some major markets that have just, I think, done a great job with their retail developments. Nashville is one of them. They've been really great about incorporating nationals, locals in a really thoughtful way and really cool projects. Um, in some ways, Atlanta has some great projects like that, but in some ways, I believe we've missed the mark. Um, and so, you know, the thought process was also we want to connect like-minded developers that are really developing based around communities and creating these unique spaces. Um, and then we're just looking to connect everybody. So we were like, let's, we're, we're calling it the, a meetup because they're conferences. We don't, we don't want your traditional conferences where people are drinking bad coffee and like sitting around in suits and keeping their information to themselves and, you know, taking notes and just, not we we wanted something that was like super laid back interactive um where people got to know each other on a personal level so you can really see what drives those people um and their businesses and so a place where we could connect a network so that's what automatic is um we're going to hold our first one this fall in atlanta um at a great development called west side paper that is a friend and colleague developer um, that has developed this beautiful office building that has a restaurant um, and retail component. Um, we're going to host the event there. It's got a great vibe. Um, it's going to be like 200 uh, people, invitation only. We're going to have 40 great retail and restaurant concepts that are going to be there um, to available to talk about what they're doing. Um, and then we are going to have some, you know, some people that have really established themselves within the communities and been very successful at becoming um, great restaurateurs. Um, and so, so they will be there to kind of speak about um, their experiences um, to hopefully help some of these um, new concepts and new businesses um, that are getting started um, and give them advice. And so it's really just a way to kind of scratch our own itch of how do we get the like-minded people together to do business together. And, um, and, and uh, hopefully it evolves from there. We see it being, you know, small breakout Zoom calls in the future, maybe once a quarter where we're sharing information, developers, um, retailers, investors. Um, maybe it's a ski trip 
um, you know, um, this, this, this winter. So, um, we're excited to see where it goes. And again, just with the whole idea of like, ultimately this relation, this, this whole industry is about relationships and it's about, um, getting connections. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do with it. I love that. It's a great idea. And I think you're the per perfect person for it. Um, you're the connector, you're the relationship builder. And um, yeah, it, it sounds like an awesome opportunity for people local to Atlanta in the commercial real estate space. Coleman, I uh, only got through about half of my questions here. This was an awesome conversation. I could have... I I, yeah, I could have talked to you all day. Um, I love this stuff. Um, if people want to connect with you, learn more about you, learn more about the automatic meetup, where would you like to send people? I would say go to our, our website, automatic meetup. Um, and uh, my contact information is there. And I would love for, um, you know, for, for people to reach out to me directly. I love, love getting emails from people. I love chatting with people. I'll go grab a cup of coffee with you and um, or lunch and, and, and let's meet and connect. Perfect. Well, this has been awesome. Coleman, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time out today, sharing your wisdom and expertise. Um, thank you so much. We'll definitely have to do this again sometime. Great. Listeners, listeners, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to connect with either one of us, please reach out. We would love to talk to you about commercial real estate until next time. Take care.